G'day guys. We've been living in the van now for the best part of three months. So we've come to really understand what works for us in the build and things that we might do differently. So we've come up with a list of eight things that we might do differently if we we're gonna do the build again. Thankfully, we put a lot of time and effort into planning out the build. So we're actually really happy with how the van is working for us. So most of these things are actually things that would probably just be a time or a money saver for us if we were doing the build, things that you know may not be necessary. Uh, there was one thing that we did have to change before we left on the trip because it wasn't working for us and it was kind of important. So we'll do that one at the end. There's also another one that we're not going to put on the list but we're going to talk about at the end because we're unsure on that but I think it's worthwhile discussing. So the first cab off the rank is the awning. We did opt for a cheaper rollout style awning when we did the build and that was because we weren't sure just how much we were going to use the awning and in fairness if we had used a more expensive wind out awning I think we probably would have used it a little bit more but not that much so we've used this awning only twice in the nearly three months that we've been on the road and that comes down to a couple of reasons so firstly it's the way we travel so we're full-time van lifing this which means we're moving a lot we usually only spend maybe a night in one place and if we're spending more time we're usually moving from the campsite and back in the day we really don't want to be setting it up and down and the second reason is the way the van is set out so we've got the full height van and we've got our built-in kitchen and cooking facilities and we've also got seating area inside the van so if there is bad weather we will just tend to sit inside and we're always cooking inside as well so i think times when an awning would be good would be if you don't have any cooking facilities inside or any seating area. So if you've got a smaller van like an iLoad or a smaller high ace or something like that, I think an awning is really good where you're cooking outside and you need somewhere to sit that's sheltered. And I think the other time that an awning is really good is where you're not doing this style of travel and you're more doing like weekend trips or longer trips where you're in one place fixed for, you know, multiple days or a week and you just want to set up your camp permanently and have it fixed there and then you're just staying in the one spot. In saying that, happy we have the awning, but I think we obviously could have saved a little bit of time and money in putting it there. It's really not something that we use all that much. So second on the list is the bathroom fan. So we have a separate shower and toilet cubicle in the van that we put in. We also put a dedicated bathroom fan in. So there it is there. So the fan actually works fine. There's nothing wrong with it, but I really don't think it was necessary to put it in. So we've used the shower and toilet with and without the fan. And mostly we use it because it you know, works fine. But yeah, as I said, I don't think it's necessary. So when we've used the shower without the fan, there is no condensation or anything that builds up in the van. And when we use the toilet without it, there's no smell or anything like that. So the main reason that I don't think we need the fan in the bathroom is because we have the max fan here and it draws air out of the shower anyway, and it runs all the time. We pretty much always have that thing on. And the second reason is we've got a nature's head toilet, which has a built-in fan in it. So when using the toilet, there's no smell from that either. It's not a bad thing that we have the fan, but I think we could have save the time and the money putting it in. Obviously, if you have a chemical toilet, you might have a bit more smell, so you might want it. And if you don't have your max fan sitting as close to the shower cubicle as we do, maybe it's worth having it. While we're looking at the shower and toilet, I'm gonna put number three on the list as the toilet. So we've got the Nature's Head composting toilet. So firstly, I don't know if it's fair to call these composting toilets because if you're using them regularly, like for us, there's two of us using it fairly regularly, we need to change the solids compartment every say four to five weeks. And that's just not enough time for it to compost. There's a few different sources on how long it takes to safely compost human waste, but it's definitely longer than four to five weeks. So yeah, whether or not you actually call it a composting toilet, it's one thing, but we're very happy with the toilet. No smell unless it's really full then you do get a bit and you know it's time to change it. And we really like that we only have to change the solids on it every say four to five weeks. And a lot of van lifers I know say, oh, you know, we don't use the toilet or we have a rule that if there's another toilet, if there's not another toilet, it's really convenient and clean. We're using our toilet. Like we yeah, use this a lot, but I think for me, the price point of the nature's head, especially imported into Australia is very high. So I would look at a cheaper option, something like the Trelino, I think it is. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right but it's a German made toilet and imported into Australia. They're about 30% cheaper than the nature's head. They're very much the same sort of style of toilet. It's a separating toilet that separates the solids and the, the liquids. They also come with ventilation fans. And one of the nice features about that is pre-bagging. So the solids in that toilet pre-bags. So we're bagging this anyway when we change it. But yeah, simply for the, the price point, we'd probably look at using a toilet like that just for the significantly cheaper price of it. Welcome to our garage. So number four on the list is our 
three kilowatt inverter. So we've got the Renergy three kilowatt inverter charger. So it also has mains charging function. Nothing wrong with this inverter at all. We're really happy with it. It does everything we need. At the time when we were buying this, we still hadn't decided if we were gonna go with gas or an all electric system for cooking and hot water. We did end up going for gas. So we've got a gas cooktop and instant gas hot water. Really with the inverter, I just think it's overkill for the setup we have and what we use. The biggest thing that we run is the coffee machine, which draws about 1.3 kilowatts. Other than that, we're charging laptops and the e-bikes. So yeah, really, I think this is just an area where we could have saved some money. So if we'd gone for a two kilowatt inverter, it would have been a cheaper product to buy. It's not all that much cheaper, but you know, there is a saving there. And I also think we could have gotten away with the way that our solar system's equipped and the way we're traveling without the mains charging function. So with a, going with a two kilowatt inverter, we could have used smaller cables and lugs, which are cheaper. And if we'd gone for say the, the Renergy two kilowatt inverter that doesn't have the charging function, they just have plugs on the inverter so you can just plug straight into it. So there's no need for an electrician to hardwire in all your equipment and your mains charging port, which is a potentially big saving there, depending if you know an electrician or not. But yeah, it's probably satisfactory for most people to go for something like that. In saying that, happy with how it works. We've run some big power tools and things when we're finishing the van, and I really like the professional sort of finish it gives having all your power points hardwired in and built into the van. It's like a nice aesthetic and it works. But yeah, it's a potential saving if you're looking to save a few dollars. Number five on the list also relates to our solar system. So under our bench seat is where the majority of our solar stuff is. So I'll briefly explain the bits that I'm talking about. We did do a whole video on the install. If you want to see that, I'll link it. So we've got our Renergy DC-DC charger, which charges the house batteries from the alternator when we're driving, which is a really nice feature to have. We've got a separate solar charge controller as well, which is the Renergy 60 amp solar charge controller. So the Renergy DC-DC charger actually has a solar charge controller in it as well. And there's a couple of reasons that we didn't utilize that as part of the build and just have the DC-DC. But I think this is an area where if you're doing something similar, you could probably save and not buy a dedicated charge controller. In saying that, it works really well. But the reason we got a separate DC-DC charger and solar MPPT charger was we wanted to wire the panels in series for a number of reasons. Did a video on that as well. And the DC-DC charger from Renergy has a, a maximum voltage input of 25 volts. So when we wired our 600 watts of solar into series, the voltage was well above that. Reason number two that we had it separated was we can utilize both the full solar charge from the panels while we're driving, as well as the full charge from the alternator while we're driving. So we can get somewhere in the order of 1.2 kilowatts of charge while we're driving. And third reason was we've used the solar charge input side of the DC-DC as a, an option for having an external panel. So if we're parked in the shade, we could put an external panel out in the sun. So we've never actually used that feature. And I think this is where you could save some money as well by just getting the DC-DC charger. While I do prefer the panels in series for a few different reasons, I think it'd be fit for purpose to run them in parallel. I think it would work fine which would mean your voltage for us would be below 25 volts and we could plug it into the DC-DC, which means we could get away with just running the DC-DC charger for both our solar and for the alternator charging. Obviously, we're not getting as much charge at any given time, but I think the way we're traveling and such, I think that would work fine. So yeah, to summarize on that, I'm really happy with the way that we did our system with the two units but it is an area where you could save a couple of hundred bucks on some equipment and probably save a little bit of time and some cable costs and such and have a little bit of a simpler setup. Number six on the list is our Cellfi Go. So if you don't know what that is, it is a mobile phone or cell phone reception booster. This is the aerial for it. Inside behind some of our cabinetry is a little unit and then plugged into that is an internal antenna as well. And what it does is basically just boost the available mobile phone signal to improve that for your use. So when it works, I'd say 80 to 90% of the time, it works quite well. So at the moment we're relatively remote in Northern Territory, just outside a little town. We had one bar of 4G, we turned this on, we've got maximum or full 4G in the van now. So it's working well here. There are times where it just, it should be working and it just doesn't do anything. People have suggested a different aerial. This is the aerial that was supplied with it by the seller. Other people have also suggested mounting the aerial higher on the van would work as well. But my biggest problem with this thing is the price point. 
in my opinion, it's very expensive for what it does. And the real problem is when you're traveling in rural or outback Australia, there's a lot of places that just don't have coverage. All you need to do is look at a coverage map to see where you're not gonna have it. And a cell phone booster or a mobile phone booster isn't gonna boost the signal where you don't have it. Probably a little bit naive on my behalf, buying it without sort of realizing that before we put it in, but yeah, it's kind of limited in where it will work and then there are fringe areas where I personally think it should be working and it's not working as well as it, it probably is. I've got it number six on loose for no real reason. These aren't in any order, but this would probably be the first thing I wouldn't spend money on if I was doing this build again. So if you are traveling in Australia or you know anywhere else remote and you need service and you want internet, I wouldn't be going with this. I'd be going with Starlink. So we traveled for about a week with another couple who had Starlink, which is Matt and Megan and they shared the internet with us when we were there. So we were in some very remote places and we had high speed internet everywhere that we were with them traveling across Queensland and the Northern Territory. This thing was doing nothing and we were able to upload videos to YouTube, you know, watch YouTube, watch whatever, do whatever. And when we were doing the build, Starlink was kind of just being introduced, especially, I don't know if the RV package had even sort of come out. It is very expensive in terms of the ongoing monthly cost, but if you're doing, say, a one-year trip of Australia and you want internet, you're much better off, in my opinion, to put the money that you might spend on this and put it into Starlink based on our experience with it anyway. So I have heard also very recently that Optus is in talks with Starlink to provide 100% coverage of Australia with a sort of partnership there using some of the satellites. Not sure how well that's gonna work or anything like that. I think it's at least one to two years off. They're gonna bring in text function first and then some further functionality later on. But that might be something to look at depending when you're watching this. Number seven, it's not really van build related, but it is the mattress that we chose. So initially we we're gonna take our mattress from home, which we didn't end up doing. And we did just get a cheap foam mattress. We did put a topper on that as well. It was okay for a couple of weeks, but then it sort of started to compress in the middle. And yeah, it hasn't been amazing. It is something we can change, but I think, yeah, we definitely look at putting a better mattress in the, the van in the future. Number eight. So this is one that we did have to change. And there's another bit that I still probably should change. So for anyone that watched our plumbing or our tank installs, you might've seen how we did this. We have two freshwater tanks underneath the van and we have a third tank in the back of the van as well. And we did have to make a change to the way that was plumbed in because it wasn't working. So under the van, the two tanks are at slightly different levels. And the way I initially plumbed it was I ran a feed line from each tank into a T and then up to the pump. And that worked fine when we had water in both those tanks. But then once the higher tank drained and was empty, there was still water in the lower tank and the pump was sucking air in from one side and water in from the other. And so the plumbing wasn't working very well. It wasn't pumping through the heater properly and it wasn't pumping through the shower and the taps. So what we did was just change that. So the pump only had a feed from the lower tank up to the pump. And then from the tank that was slightly higher, I just ran a pipe from the low point into the low point of the other tank. So this higher tank drains into the second one. Since we did that, it's been working really well. So we haven't had that same issue with it sucking air in. The tanks are draining really well from one to another. But yeah, that was something we had to change because it just wasn't functioning once we'd used up one of our tanks of water. There is another little bit of the plumbing that I should probably change as well. It's working fine. We just, we just lose a little bit of water off the top of the top tank. And it's just the way the breather is set up on that. So it comes straight out the top of the tank and then down. So what happens is we fill the tank up till it comes out the breather and then it drains down a little bit. So we lo we're losing a little bit of water. And then as well, when we're going downhill, the breather's at the front. So the water comes to the front of the tank and we're losing a bit more there. So all I need to do to fix that is get a couple of more joints and bring the breather up above the top of the tank before bringing it down. It's a relatively simple fix. I just need to go somewhere that has some John Guest fittings. We didn't have this issue on the underneath tanks because I ran the breather from the top of the tanks and then I secured them to the underneath of the van. So the tip of the breather is sitting higher than the tank. So we haven't had that same issue underneath. But yeah, that's it for all of the main items on the list. And then I do have one discussion point as well which is something to consider. So the last thing I wanna talk about, I haven't put it on the list, but I think it's really an important one or an interesting one to discuss. And that is the all electric versus gas. So anyone that watched our build would have known that we 
debated this pretty heavily whether to put gas in or all electric and we did end up putting gas in so we've got two four kilo gas bottles in here and we've got instant gas hot water and we've got a gas cooktop as well so don't get me wrong the gas is awesome we really love the gas setup and the convenience it offers the instant gas hot water is really nice to have it means you know i've gone swimming randomly unexpectedly in the rain under a waterfall freezing cold and then just run back for a nice shower and it also means we don't have a huge drain on our solar system as well but in saying that putting gas in is a big expense especially in australia where there's a lot of standards and regulations you've got to put an external gas box in you have to have everything fitted by a professional gas fitter you have to have it certified um, you do also have the cost of gas the appliances are more expensive the gas hot water is substantially more expensive than a electric hot water the same probably applies for the gas cooktop i think they're more expensive than an electric or an induction but yeah it means you have a lot of convenience and you have a lot less draw on your solar system but in saying that i think for the type of travel that we're doing we could get away with all electric and a big part of that comes down to the DC-DC charger. So traveling Australia, we're doing a lot of Ks. So the DC-DC charger is constantly working really hard, boosting batteries. So when we traveled with Matt and Megan, they actually have an all electric system, relatively similar sized solar system to us. Same amount of battery storage, pretty much the same solar. And for the most part for them, it's been working pretty well. I think there's been a couple of times where they've got the batteries down fairly low and sometimes they've got to be a bit more cautious with how much power they're using but for the most part with traveling a lot it works quite well and i think it comes down to that a lot and depending where you are and what sort of travel you're doing so if you want to go and camp up somewhere for quite a period of time and you're not using your dc dc charger it's going to have a lot more drain and you're going to rely on your solar a lot more also depending where you are in the world you might not have as much solar. So in Australia, we're quite lucky in that we have quite a lot of sun and for long periods throughout the day. So we do get quite good solar, but yeah, depending where you are, that's gonna factor in. But yeah, for traveling Australia, Matt and Megan, for example, have been getting away without it. And so they've saved a fair bit on not having to buy the instant gas hot water unit, not having to have the gas fitter, and also the time and effort in putting in these units as well, because the permanent gas hot water means you've got to cut a hole out gas box means you've got to cut a hole out so there's a lot of time and work in that so i don't know I'm, I'm on the fence still but i think if we were doing it again i would probably look closely at going for an all electric in saying that a couple of those items i mentioned earlier so i probably wouldn't change so i wouldn't change the inverter and the mains charging unit i would keep the separate dc dc charger and solar charge controller and I'd probably put in a little bit more battery storage as well, just to give me a bit more of a buffer. So one thing to keep in mind with an electric hot water system, so what they've got, I think, is the Duetto system. They do have to pre-plan. So when they want to have a shower, they have to switch it on. Depending if they're using 240, I think half an hour to 40 minutes beforehand. And if it's 12 volt, I think it can take a couple of hours to heat the hot water. And then once they've used it, you know, they've got to heat it again. So there is a bit more planning that goes into it. But yeah, with the gas, you just jump in and use it whenever. Hopefully this has helped you out. If you're looking to do a build, some of the things that we've found we haven't needed, some of the things where we've spent money where we probably didn't need to, it's probably the biggest one, as well as some time savings on the build. But yeah, thanks for watching. And if you found it helpful, give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and we'll see you in the next one.